but not too comfortably, because I'm going to take you all on a journey, actually. And it's worse than the journey back home to the airport that you'll be making later. It's a journey from the brink of humanity six million years ago to a really important date, a date which is essential and why you're all sitting where you're sitting today. And a little girl is going to help to illustrate this journey. It was a beautiful summer's day in Copenhagen. The sun was shining and Vivi was a 12-year-old girl with blonde hair, apple red rosy cheeks. She loved playing in a local park, she loved going on her favorite swing. What she didn't realize was that a day earlier, a tiny droplet crossed the counter of a bakery she was in onto her hands, onto her mouth, into her small intestine, into her muscles. Twelve hours later, when her mum tried to wake her up to go to school, she was too weak. She couldn't get up. They took her into the local Blegedems Hospital in Copenhagen, and there she met a man who was about to change her life and about to change all our lives, actually. That man, we now know, was Bjorn Ibbotson, who was an anaesthetist at the time, and he did two things which were remarkable. Firstly, he realized that Vivi was suffering from acute, severe bulbar paralysis from polio. She was one of over 300 patients during the 1953 Copenhagen epidemic. But he also knew that they had used the last iron lung in Blegendam's hospital. But rather than let Vivi die, when he saw her breaths becoming more and more shallow, her blood pressure going higher and higher with the effects of hypercarbia, he made a cut in her neck, or he organized for a cut in her neck, and gave her what we've just been hearing about. He gave her positive pressure ventilation. And that was radical for this type of disease. But not only did he do that, he then organized a system of care a system of medical students to squeeze that bag in eight-hour shifts for days and days and weeks and weeks. And he formed an intensive care unit, and that's why I'm here, and that's why you're here. But so what? How has intensive care changed? It's fourth evolution, perhaps, since 1953, but why am I telling you this? Who cares? Well, my journey to this stage started in a conference a few years ago in Dublin. I spoke about my research topic, sepsis, at the time. I thought it went well. I enjoyed it. I had a pat on the back, said, oh, well done. That was a great talk. And then I went to a bar in Dublin that night, which is where all good stories start. Had a drink, spoke to a, somebody local, and they said, why are you here in Dublin? I said, well, I'm speaking at a conference. What's it about? Intensive care. I was very excited. And she said, what's that? I thought, oh my goodness. I spent a decade writing academic papers that nobody reads, coming to conferences, speaking to audiences who actually know more about the topic than me. But I've forgotten about probably the most important people in this circle, and that's the public, and that's patients. And so that night, I wrote down why I started doing intensive care, which was about a boy called Christopher, who I met a decade earlier. I sent that to a couple of people, and I'm pleased to say in May 2019, uh, there'll be a book, a popular science book, aimed at the general public, all about intensive care medicine. It'll be called Critical, How Intensive Care Can Save Your Life. But this isn't a book about me. This is a book about you, actually and I need your help. because so I want this to reflect the specialty and I want it to help with the public. It will have chapters about each organ system, each chapter with a message to try to make our job easier and to increase survivor patients. So the heart topic, for example, will talk about the importance of bystander CPR in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. There's a few strands to this. 
This is the environment I feel comfortable in. If I go into a general practice and sit down with a chair and a patient, I feel nervous, my hands sweat, my heart goes quick. But actually, this complex environment is where I, I feel at home. But for our patients and our relatives, this is an extraordinarily chaotic, worrying environment. So my hope is to try to simplify this. And in fact, in many ways, intensive care is relatively simple. It takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in something, but I hope, perhaps in the next 15 seconds, 30 seconds, to explain my approach to intensive care. And it's straightforward. You need three things. First of all, you give critically ill patients time. And that's why we use fancy machines. They don't cure anything. They just give us time to cure something. Secondly, key to that, is a diagnosis. It dictates what we do, why we do it, and whether you will survive or not. And sometimes that can be lost in the mellow of equipment, supportive management. And finally, the most important thing, of course, is care. Not just physical care, but psychological care. And so, in summary, there's really only four treatments that work in intensive care. Antibiotics, maybe. Surgery sometimes, steroids, rarely, and nursing staff and time. And nothing else really works. The other strand that I want to write about includes the history of intensive care, which perhaps could be summed up in three ways. We've spent decades making things great. We've given loads of blood, loads of fluid, loads of oxygen, and we know it kills you. Now we are in the phase of less is more, not only less fluid, less blood, less oxygen, less tests. And the future is impossible to predict, but what will it include? Well, it will probably include making things personal, whether that's point of care, metagenomics, epigenetics. Certainly, as Luciana just said, we need to treat that person in front of us and we don't treat a meta-analysis. Another aspect which I'm passionate about is research. Research in intensive care is difficult. It costs a huge amount of money. It's controversial, and it sparks debate. And that's just for the professionals, yet alone the patients. There's a bit of a trend at the minute, in sepsis, for example, my background research, to promote only public awareness and quality improvement. And that's great. Time to antibiotics is absolutely essential. And yes, we should decrease that. But are you happy with a mortality rate of 20% in people with septic shock? Now, is that the quality improvement that we're going to stop at? Of course not. We had a quality improvement and public drive for better care of meningitis. And there were hundreds of children dying in 1999 before the meningitis C vaccine. We had a TV campaign about getting a glass and rubbing it on a rash to see what kind of rash it was. And that's great, that's brilliant. It's not what has made only two people in the last 12 months get meningitis C. The thing that did that was research, basic fundamental research applied. It was a vaccine that did that. And I think that can't be lost from the public debate about improving quality improvement. Death is something we deal with every day. One in five of us here will die in an intensive care unit. And yet that girl in Dublin I spoke to didn't know what an intensive care unit was. And I think confronting death and the choices at the end of death, for us as a profession is difficult, and for patients it's even more difficult. And again, I think this is a big strand that really needs to be highlighted. My journey to intensive care was about a decade ago when I met Christopher. And I've had the opportunity through writing this book to go back and speak to patients months, years, decades after I last met them. And that's been a privilege, actually. It's probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my career, was knocking on Christopher's family door 
10 years after he died, after I first met him. He went to Nairobi with a school trip. It was going to be the trip of his life. He climbed up Mount Kenya with children from a local slum. He helped an elderly lady climb up the top of Mount Kenya. And 12 hours later, he was in Nairobi Hospital with acute, severe pneumonia. I met him three weeks later when he was transferred to intensive care, uh, where I was working at that time. He had his 18th birthday party in our intensive care unit. I remember the cake. And I also remember the look in his mum's eyes when the consultant told her that her son had died. But going back to speak to that family was probably the most nervous I've ever been. But in fact, it also brought a huge amount of insight, and I'm very grateful for that. I learnt in the years after his death, they had built a school in Nairobi. And in that school were children who walked up Mount Kenya with Christopher. And in that school, there are now children who have the opportunity to work in the hospital where Christopher was looked after. And it got me thinking, we often don't see patients this far into a journey, a decade after. And I often used to think, what do people want? Well, they want a cure, they want a diagnosis, they want pain relief, they want treatment. But actually, I think I was wrong. I don't know what everybody wants, but certainly what the families I've met and the patients I've met in this journey, they all want to make sense of their story, a story which is often not told. I'm also delighted, and thanks to Annas Perno and others in Copenhagen, to have gone back and looked at some of the original records. And it just amazes me to see that little girl's face, Vivi, the day she was admitted to Blegendam's hospital. And this is in the actual handwriting of Bjorn Ibbinson. And reading this in translation, actually, it's the same as we do today. They gave her time. They tried to get a diagnosis and care, and they delivered care. And that's what we all strive to do today. And so what happened to her? Well, she survived. She eventually was discharged from that Blegendam's hospital. She went home. She fell in love. She worked as a secretary. Seven years later, she was readmitted with pneumonia as a result of the chronic lung disease that she'd suffered from that acute illness. And sadly, Vivi too died at the age of 31. I took this photo after a night shift, actually, a quite, quite a hard, long night shift. We still do resident nights in Cardiff, so if anybody wants to come and work, it's, it's wonderful, resident night shifts. But it made me think, actually, exploring these families and the history, often it's sad, but sometimes knowing that sadness equally can give you not only hope for the future, but sometimes that darkness can show you the light. And my hope is to be honest in a book that talks about difficult topics where sometimes we don't know the right answer, to debate what we should do rather than what we can do. And my hope today is to ask you guys for help in this, because as I said, this is a story which is about you and your patience and not about me. Thanks.